what we really are is one global civilization connected through infrastructure and supply chains. And just because you didn't make your t-shirt uh, that you're wearing right now, you know, you are part of the supply chain by which that cotton was farmed somewhere, water was used to treat it, it was the electricity was used in a factory, human labor went into it, and then it was shipped, uh, you know, on, a, on some, uh, you know, cargo vessel across the oceans to come back to you. So you are part of that footprint of that t-shirt. And the same goes for the manufacturing of, uh, of you know, um, any kind of, you know, mobile phone product. <laughs> Dr. Parag Kanan is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Parag is a leading global strategy advisor, world traveler, and best-selling author. He is founder and managing partner of Future Map, a data and scenario-based strategic advisory firm. Parag's newest book, The Future is Asian, Commerce, Conflict, and Culture in the 21st Century came out in 2019. He is the author of a trilogy of books on the future of the world order beginning with the Second World Empires and Influence, a New Global Order, which came out in 2008, followed by How to Run the World, charting a course to the next renaissance in 2011, and concluding with Connectography, Mapping the Future of Global Civilizations, which came out in 2016. He is also the author of Technocracy in America, Rise of the Info State in 2017, and co-author of Hybrid Reality, Thriving in the Emerging Human Technology Civilization in 2012. Parag was named one of the of Esquire's 75 most influential people of the 21st century and featured in Wired Magazine's Smart List. He holds a PhD from the London School of Economics and a bachelor's of master's degree from the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. He has traveled to nearly 150 different countries and is a young global leader of the World Economic Forum. Parag has been honored as a, as a young global leader, but also has served on the West Global Future Council on Mobility, Global Agenda Council on Geoeconomics, and advisory board of its Future of Urban Development Initiative. He also serves on the board of trustees of the New Cities Foundation, Council of the American Geographical Society, advisory board of independent, uh, as an advisory board independent diplomat. He is a former term member of the Council on Foreign Relations, International Institute for Strategic Studies and fellow of the Royal Geographical Society. In 2002, he was awarded the OECD Future Leaders Prize. He speaks German, Hindi, French, Spanish, and Arabic. Khan spoke at the TED in 2016. TED Global 2019, uh, 2009 was a guest host of the TED Global 2012 and lead speaker at TEDx Gateway in 2018. His TED Talks have been viewed more than 3 million times. The maps customized by Dr. Khan's books have been displayed in numerous prestigious international arts exhibitions. And if I am correct, he lives in Singapore with his wonderful wife and, and partner, and they, they're running around the world, conquering it and doing wonderful things for humanity and society. Welcome, Parag. So good to have you on the show. Pleasure. Thanks for having me on, Mark. It's such an honor to have you on the show, and I, I'm an avid stalker of yours on and offline and following your talks and all your books. I've read your books and really love your work, the way you think and the way you've been active around the world. I want to jump right into uh, and things, kind of let, let my listeners know how we got to uh, kind of our paths crossed and how I asked you to the show. We have a mutual friend, Claudia Rinka, and I want to thank her for introducing us, um, who is a, a writer and 
and produces films and documentaries. And uh, we got together on a documentary called Now by Jim Raketa that we were in together, although we weren't uh, in the same set or, or part of the documentary, never got to meet, but uh, that was a wonderful work that uh, is just now releasing. I kind of teased Claudia and Jim and the, and the producers of the film or uh, of the documentary that they should have maybe uh, called the, the movie, not, not the documentary, not now, but uh, yesterday because of the pandemic, it's kind of was in this old business model that it wasn't set up for streaming and online and still traditional movie theater things. And so it's just now in November getting going and maybe January out in the theaters and different places around the world. My first question for you is, how have you weathered this pandemic? We, we heard your biography and this long list of what you've done over the years and how you've worked with globalization and, and, and maps and, and been around the world. Has any of that helped you to get through this crazy time? It's a great question, Mark. And I, you know, I'm glad to see that you've actually uh, pivoted well. You've been digital, you've been doing your show virtually, you've been talking to people from all over the world. So, uh, you know, fortunately you were prepared. Uh, and, and I fortunately was as well in terms of just digital connectivity, you know, carrying on with work, you know, with uh, the, the governments that I work with, the companies I work with, the various organizations, just moving to virtual, you know, and uh, other than geographically staying put, I would say our day-to-day -day life here uh, hasn't really changed much at all. Uh, you know, obviously I'm accustomed to traveling every single week, uh, but it's uh, physically a lot healthier not to, you know, it's certainly better for the environment. Um, so, you know, pivoted to this new normal uh, pretty seamlessly. Uh, I, I think you and I both have a lot of sympathy for people around the world who are not, not nearly as uh, fortunate. A lot of the governments that, that uh, I speak with or, or work with uh, in the past have been talking about their digital plans, broadband, 5G, you know, Wi-Fi for everyone. And uh, they never, they, they, they didn't do it in time, that's for sure. And they, they regret it and their populations are... Um, are suffering a little bit more as a result. So it's one of the many lessons, obviously, from this pandemic. That's kind of like a business and governmental infrastructural problem that it wasn't up to speed prepared for such a pandemic. But uh, there's also a way to get a, a certain amount of resilience uh, in your own life that you're, you're, you're already used to working very remotely, very used to working digitally and online. And, and so I believe for us, it was probably an easier transition. Do you um, have you been contacted or reached out to during this time? To say, man, we should have listened to you uh, more uh, and, and applied some of the things that you've discussed and, and prepared better, so that we would also have that resilience, or maybe advise companies to get back to, to some kind of a structure. Well, so seizing the digital opportunity now is uh, something that everyone is doing. So whether or not they are early movers or late starters, either way, one can always do better. So even in a place like Singapore, where Wi-Fi is pretty much ubiquitous, fiber is as well, there's still a couple of gaps. You know, it, it can come down to the quote unquote last mile. So do enough kids have laptops that they can borrow from school or get subsidized? You know, it's become a big problem in Germany. Germany is a huge country, the US as well, but they have a very egalitarian system in Germany and they want all kids to have you know, equal access. So you know, that's a lot of laptops in a country of 80 million people and X number of school children. So you know, that's the obvious stuff at this point. And I have to say you know, that the private sector has stepped up uh, in many ways and found ways to lower barriers to access and, and provide uh, you know, connectivity to people. And again, it's a team effort. We're in a pretty unprecedented situation. But of course, that's just one aspect of the response. You know, I mean, the world has learned a lot in the last eight to 10 months about what is an essential service and a non-essential service, right? And we've learned things in social policy. We should be paying our healthcare workers and, um, and other professionals who, uh, you know, deliver food or medicine and all of these kinds of things a lot more than we do. Sanitation as well, as much as anything else. So that's also important. So I think there, there's many of us who are taking stock of what the lessons for policy are and uh, kind of, you know, what, what is the playbook? And the playbook obviously can't just be fighting the last war, right? It's also what comes next. The next crisis is uh, 
again, it's a climate, climate one or a political one or an economic one or all at the same time. So, you know, resilience, preparedness is, um, is a very long checklist in a way. And, uh, and I hope that, you know, the, the governments that have been negligent are going to wake up. And, and, you know, again, for all the, the tragedy, uh, Mark, in all of this, at least I see, again, over in Asia, I observe, you know, the, the four plus billion people of this region, 30 or 40 countries, a little bit more closely than I do many other places. But there are very poor countries here. And what I see is pragmatism and alertness. And you know, a sub sobriety. This has been a, a gut punch, a wake up call. There is no time for corruption right now. There, you know, everyone is watching what governments are doing. You can't be asleep at the switch. Um, and so, this is you know a time for real leadership. And I and what what is nice to see is that even in some of the poorest countries in the world, they're working as hard as they possibly can. You know, they they know how serious this dilemma is, and I hope that they maintain that focus on good governance coming out of this. So uh, there, there's really this overarching theme of, you know, um, obviously at first it's the COVID and, and then it could be the recession and then there's this climate change wave and then actually beyond that is the di biodiversity and there's just a lot of issues going on, a lot of issues during the pandemic uh, as well with Black Lives Matters and, and with issues uh, around Brexit and issues around uh, obviously the election and other things. Are you feeling uh, in your work or, or in, in your life or in, in what you're researching and studying that uh, there's this dooming civilization collapse or this unease with humanity around the world where we're feeling this uh, civilization framework structures around the world is just not working for us all anymore. There's a lot more unease and unrest going on. There, it, at times like this, it becomes, you know, a meme to talk about civilizational collapse. And there's a whole literature on specific civilizations, whether it is ancient Mesopotamian civilizations, the Egyptians or the Mayans and so forth, and what brought them down. And so we're not talking about global civilization just yet, right? I mean, if suddenly you have um, a cataclysmic atmospheric event, that leads to the destruction of the whole human species, fine. <laughs> but what we're, what we're talking about at the moment is which societies of the many societies different, you know, differentiated and geographically uh, detached societies there are in the world, which ones are really not gonna make it, you know, um, based upon where things are going right now and what happens to them. Can they do anything? Can we do anything for them? Or where do they have to go? So that could be specific countries, a country like Yemen. And you know, the catastrophe in Yemen has nothing to do with the pandemic. The pandemic has just made the existing catastrophe worse. There are places like India where you have groundwater depletion and terrible air pollution. And that was all before the pandemic as well. So the question is not, are we having a global civilizational collapse imminently? It's which places are, are already you know, potentially past the point of no return and what, if anything, can be done to help them. And, uh, and that, that's, you know, much more nuts and bolts, but, but you know, realistic uh, assessment. And, you know, we have a lot of, you know, quantitative metrics and indicators and studies and rankings around this stuff. But you and I also travel and, and see the, the, the human suffering and hardship and toll. And you don't need an index to tell you when some of the fundamentals environmentally are, are ir irrevocable, irredeemable you know, in certain places. And I fear that we're not having a serious enough conversation uh, about that. And, and there, you know, there's parts of obviously the Middle East, and North Africa, parts of Central and South America, certainly parts of South Asia, where, uh, you know, these, these dire forecasts uh, apply. There's really, in your book, Connectography, um, not only beautiful maps and, and, and things depicted in there, but a lot of the maps we're used to, even the one behind me, are really, um, they're outdated, they're very nationalistic, or they tell a different view or a picture of, of, of our world. And, and the re reason I really like your books, but also what you discuss and, and the maps you present is kind of when we look at them based on data, there's just a whole different story that tends to emerge or something that comes out that we're like, hmm, well, maybe, maybe it's not that 
this is not what we've been led uh, to believe or what the way we view the world is actually occurring differently. And um, with that, I, I, I wanna kind of move into, do you feel like you're a global citizen and how would you feel about a world without nations, borders and divisions? I mean, that's the kind of central question that has, you know, animated a lot of my research and work and thinking and dreaming for more than a, a decade. But, you know, in, in that same book, uh, Connectography, I talk about how we actually have more borders and more nations and more sovereign units than we've ever had in human history. So we're, we're really a far, far way. <laughs> we're a long way away from a borderless world. But what I want people to understand is that the way you get to a borderless world is very, very paradoxical. The way you get to a borderless world is by having the maximum number of borders. And I'm not sure that people understand that. So let me just flesh it out in 30 seconds. When you make political units smaller and smaller and smaller, imagine an independent you know, uh, Massachusetts and an you know, independent a republic of the Altai in Russia and you know independent states in, of India, you wind up with a world, imagine a world of you know 600 countries, right? Absolutely zero of them can survive alone, right? Zero. The idea of autarky, of self-sufficiency disappears. Then we realize, oh my God, we actually cannot survive without each other. We now have to open up to our neighbors. We have to connect to our neighbors. Um, and, uh, and build these larger federations. So it's kind of like the European Union where you went from the hereditary empires of uh, the medieval world to the sovereign nation states, uh, which were obviously very fragmented. And now since World War II, you have the European Union, which is this umbrella federation, and they share roads and highways and railways and a currency and electricity grids, right, and laws. Right, So it's because Europe is so small and yet has so many smaller units within it that more or less none of them are really survivable based upon the way in which they've built their collective economy and legal structure and so forth. So that's how you get to a borderless world. Europe is borderless, but remember it has dozens and dozens of borders, right? So I want the whole world to go through that evolutionary process and that's how you get to borderlessness. Is there, is there some even so a little bit more bottom up or is there a little bit uh, on, a, on an individual basis? How, how do you make that shift or that paradigm? Is there certain things that you should be looking at or doing or, or researching to kind of start to, to move your thinking in that way? Or, or, or how, how, how have you seen that transition for people to make that shift? Well, to be honest, it's, it's a historical, and I used the word evolutionary before, um, a natural, it's a human and psychological process. Let me give you a couple of examples. Um, if you look at the world map, the political map of the year 1945, there were 51 countries, and today there are about 200. So the vast majority, three quarters of the countries on the planet were born since 1945 mostly out of colonial, out of European empires, right? And the remnants of those empires through decolonization. So now if you look at the post-colonial regions of the world, particularly Southeast Asia, East Africa, and the Middle East, in a couple of these regions, you see that now you are three and soon to be the fourth generation on from that independence. At the time of independence, these were highly fragile, insecure, unstable countries. They were fighting with their neighbors, seeking to figure out what's my land, what's your land. The Europeans drew these crazy straight lines and we don't even know, you know where our borders are, this makes no sense. Um, and then you start to stabilize, but you've got the Cold War manipulating your politics and it's still divide and conquer in some way. Now you have this post Cold War period and you have the global economy and capital markets and supply chains. And you start to say, oh, I'm a landlocked country. I need to have a pipeline and a railway and electricity grid with my neighbors. I need to maybe have some kind of a, you know, figure out how to stabilize our exchange rates so it's not so crazy when we're moving fruit and, you know, coal across our borders or whatever the case may be. And so if you look at East Africa, you know, one of the poorest regions of the world, you look at Southeast Asia, where I now live, still a very poor region, 
over the last four generations, they have come an incredibly long way in that kind of European style process. Now, they're never going to have an East African Union. You're never going to have an Asian Union. It doesn't have to be the same thing. It's the process. It's the people who are the great, great grandchildren of the founding leaders saying, you know what? I wasn't alive then. You weren't alive then. I'm sure our grandparents hated each other, but we've got better things to do right now. Let's build this railway across our borders. Let's have a joint investment promotion board. Let's do that deal together. Let's have a visa free access to each other's countries, that kind of thing. And that is happening. It's happening in so many places. And it's incredible. Africa has plans for a continent wide free trade area continent-wide free mobility zone. That's amazing. Are they gonna get there tomorrow? No, but were African leaders, did they have the confidence you know, 20 years ago, 10 years ago to have that summit and make those plans and write that declaration? They didn't and they do now. And that's just part of the evolution. And, and I literally think it's beautiful. This is cartographic beauty. This is why I make maps. This is why uh, I have maps made, I should say, to match my writing and why they get animated because it is in a constantly evolving thing. The, the human political, the, the global political body is an organism, right, of our design. I um, belong to this group that may be of an interest. You may already somehow be involved as well. It's, a, it's through the United Nations uh, Development Program and Environmental Program, they're kind of merging together. Uh, through a good friend of mine uh, uh, who, who is working with the UN in digital area. His name is David Jensen. And we work on a project together. I work on five different projects with the UN, but this one's called the Digital Ecosystem for the Earth. And what it is, it's an open source, transparent uh, um, compilation of about 1,200 plus geospatial data points from you know DLR in Germany, from the a European Space Agency from NASA, from Google Earth, and, and many, many other planet, and uh, that is kind of bringing them all in one spot, kind of making them open source and transparent, but secure through digital ledger technology and that, so that that not only people in the UN World Economic Forum, but we can have access to that in one place and, and use the, that cartography, that map, those 3D visualizations of, you know, whether it's precipitation and uh, moisture, soil moisture, or whatever else is, is going on in our world, real time, kind of up to date. Um, it's, a, it's a super project, but I, can, I think you would fit in there so beautifully in, the, in that project. I'll have to make sure to connect you if you're not already, um, because I really believe that that, that knowledge is, you know, we talk sometimes about this moonshot or this earth shot, you know, what, what is that? It's innovation. Had we not gone to the moon, had we not sent uh, satellites out into space, had we not used that emerging technology, we probably would have discovered the earth a lot later and we wouldn't have that innovation, that data to kind of give us the true picture of, of what's going on and how we live. And, and uh, having said that, I was wondering if I could kind of not play the devil's advocate, but get into some more recent examples in our world. One of them will kind of touch on your book, Future is Asian, but the other one is the Brexit is probably a recent, um, uh, recent racial, political job uh, uh, type of a situation that happens that, that went to lock down borders and move away from the EU. Would that be okay if we kind of touch on that and dissect that example? Sure. And maybe you could tell me how close we are. So uh, a lot of that vote it was, uh, 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 was for a lot of people very shocking. Very, they didn't understand why it happened. And, and uh, I'm, I'm not sure one person could say, well, this is, this is the reason. But there was some tendency. There was a lot of distrust or unease uh, in the United Kingdom about the loss of jobs to migrant workers or, you know, and they're saying between 200,000 and, and clear on up in some seasons, 600,000 immigrant workers, mainly coming to the United Kingdom to work on farms, to be food producers, to sell in grocery stores, to sell at uh, uh, restaurants and food chains. 
Um, and um, a lot of the vote was to, to, to bring those jobs back to the United Kingdom, but also to ha stop having immigrant people, you know, take their resources and their, their jobs away. And so after the, the Brexit uh, occurred, we had the lockdown, you know, uh, not, too, not too long afterwards. And what happened was really crazy because it was harvest time in the United Kingdom and there were no immigrant workers there to harvest the food, to produce the food, to be workers. In some respects, it was good because those, a lot of those shops were closed. A lot of the restaurants were closed, but in other respects, it was pretty bad. And what they were doing was digging mass graves for food. They would harvest it and just till it right back into the ground. And so not only was it a resource waste, it was a big cause of, of methane because once you rebury that food, it rots, it ferments, it turns into methane, which created huge problems through a political decision that had wide reaching ripple effects. But even more so, if you look at the map, if you look at the cartography of the United Kingdom where they produce their food around the world, it's four times the size of the United Kingdom. So one, they were um, not only not allowing people to help them, but also when that vote occurred, not a lot of people jumped into those jobs to help harvest that food and produce that food. And so I just kind of want to put that into light, but that is really a cartography. It's really a big thing. And I was wondering what your standpoints, what your ideas, what your understanding of that, because I think that's a recent border and division and closing us off and how, how maybe you could dissect how you feel that works for us as a world or, or what your understanding is of it. I mean, a couple of things that stand out about Brexit, you know, not in, in no particular order. The first is that it's simply not representative of the global pattern. You know, if it weren't for the headline Brexit and the fact that it happened you know, in the UK, and, you know, we're all exposed to English language media globally, um, you know, the fact is, it just wouldn't be as big a deal. It made a big deal of itself, because that's what British culture does. Um, but to speak of it as representative is just flatly false. You know, you and I were just talking about these swaths of the world that are integrating more together. Now, the population of this East African set of countries that we're talking about is 300 million people. The population of Southeast Asia is 700 million people. So that's a billion people right there. The population of the United Kingdom is about 55 or 60 million people, right? Now, I'm not saying that it's irrelevant to the world. I'm saying that we have to put it in context, right? It's not representative of what's happening in Western civilization. It's not representative of what's happening in Europe. Brexit is what's happened to the UK. That's point number one. The second point is they're the biggest losers. You know, I remember in 2016, people said that um, uh, this is going to bring down the European Union. There's going to be a cascade of nationalist movements and so forth. Well, that was all wrong, right? When you do something dumb, you're usually the biggest loser from what you did right? And what the world has learned to do, and this is all part of that same evolution, is to isolate uh, these kinds of uh, bad situations as, as much as we can, right? So a pandemic is maybe the opposite example or a financial crisis. The question is, how quickly can you contain the locus of the, or from which the, uh, the sort of pain has emanated, right? China managed to shut down its own virus, right? Now it's the rest of the world struggling to do it. When it comes to Brexit, it's the British economy that suffers the most, not the European as a whole. Greece, their financial crisis, same thing. If there is a war in Libya, civil war in Libya, and their oil no longer can be exported, well, the rest of the world has plenty of oil. As much as we don't want the world to be using oil, the fact is that oil prices are not going to quintuple overnight because of Libya. So Libyans become their, the biggest losers from their own war. And that's very different from the world of just 30 or 40 years ago, where if you do have um, a, a disturbance in one place, again, especially economically, it ripples around the world instantly, right? And in oil markets and so forth. So we're actually learning a lot. And I think that what pretty much any sane country learned from Brexit is never to do anything as dumb as Brexit. And, and I think it's important to be incredibly blunt about it 
in equal and opposite measure to the extent to which people cried out that this is representative of the whole world, right? For every time a British person or someone who champions Brexit or thinks it's a big deal makes it out to be a harbinger of things to come, remind them just what a stupid and counterproductive and self-destructive sort of move it was. And I think that's how we set the conversation straight. And not only because we want to and we believe in progress, but because that's actually the correct, factually accurate assessment of the situation. I think that's so uh, beautifully said, and, and I totally agree with you because a lot of things has, has, have happened, especially the election, uh, has taken like a, this microscopic view. We've been able to see things a lot clearer now. So, boy, that was a big mistake. Or, boy, we don't want that to happen again. And through that process, there's quite an evolution that occurs that said, boy, we're, we're not going to make that mistake again or, you know, what, what, uh, that bad decision of, of that, uh, you know, Trumpocalypse, Bolsonaro's, Putin, Shays, or whoever it is around the world is making crazy um, decisions for the rest of us, how that has, a, you know, a ripple effect. And, and uh, there's been a lot of those um, zoom in, zoom out moments this last year, especially, I think. So uh, I don't know how it was for you, but this year actually began out as a bang, you know, the decade of action, really wonderful, a lot of positive, busier than ever, um, was on this uh, tour to Road to Davos tour and uh, a lot of speaking engagements then spoken in Davos and, and things were just a, a lot of big corporations were taking a lot of sustainability movements and transitions. Um, and, and then this pandemic occurred. And for me, it's, it's been real positive out, as we discussed before, but I wanted to um, touch upon the fact now they're, they're gonna move uh, the, the form to Lucerne um, next year and open it up to a little bit bigger city, a little bit more accessible, probably price points to attend. But one, one thing that I really like that ties to your cartography is the transformational maps that came out in 2018 on the World Economic Forum page, they're um, basically systems dynamic modeling, systems thinking, but uh, uh, Klaus Schwab wrote about it in his book, The Fourth Industrial Revolution, but he also touched upon it on the website in 2018, releasing these transformational maps, which are as another form of, of mapping, you know, uh, some of our global problems in our, in our industries and how they tie to so many other things around the world. Well, just last week, a week and a half ago, the World Economic Forum came out with uh, a new function for that, that, that each co corporation or individual can actually go in and, and for a certain fee or for certain requirements, do a personalization of their focus area, of their, their business, of what they're trying to you know, discuss and make that map personal. How do you, have you done any research or, or, or worked at all with the transformational maps and how do you feel this new tool? Uh, do you feel it is a new tool that can really help us and, and do some great things for us? Well, I do a lot of scenario planning actually with uh, with governments and companies. So, you know, scenarios should, are never really done the same way twice. It really depends on what, uh, you know, the, the organization wants to figure out what's the time horizon, what are the variables that they think are intersecting to shape their, uh, you know, their, the, the landscape of their business or their, or their strategic planning. So, uh, we do a lot of that. And um, I think transformation maps is a good tool. It, it sort of contributes in some ways to that. Um, what I like about it most is it's interdisciplinary. And, and you know, we, we are very, very careful uh, to be as interdisciplinary as possible to figure out how um, you know, scientific and technological factors weigh upon the economic or the or the political, societal, and how those affect each other. So this is the kind of approach that you know way more uh, actors need to start using. There's no question about it. So the the future is Asian. I'd like you to kind of give us a, a, a bigger teaser of it, but I I, I want to caveat it or with a question. Uh, so I have a a good friend who's also a TED speaker, uh, Gino Yu from Hong Kong. And um, he, he throws out a big question in his TED Talks in the beginning of it and says, 
what has what innovations has Asia brought out in the last 300 years? And then he goes in specifically and talks about emotional intelligence, IQ, uh, um, and just some other things that they do bring out that are that are much better for our world. And so I'd like you to kind of touch on both of those, if you would. Sure. I mean, this is kind of an age old debate in the sense of, um, you know, what are the relative merits of Eastern and Western systems, right? Or in this case, you know, Asian systems and particularly Confucian systems and how their mentality or psychology, anthropology is different. I wouldn't necessarily call that innovation, right? Though that's ways of life and ways of thinking. And we all have, you know, different societies have different approaches to that, and I think that that's fine. Innovation, you know, strictly so that so that the term innovation doesn't mean everything and nothing at the same time. Let's stick to using it the way we conventionally do, which is kind of looking at processes, uh, technologies, and how we apply them to create value or enhance kind of you know well-being or productivity or whatever the case may be. And there, I think it's pretty open and shut, right? So you know, five G internet speed emerged through an international process of developing standards and technologies and equipment, but Asian countries applied it to their countries a lot faster. Look at China, South Korea, and Japan, right? Um, the apps on your phone, right? You know, Amazon is one innovative app, Google is another, Facebook is another, whether it's social media or web search or e-commerce, but it was the Chinese who put them all together into this WeChat ecosystem and added a whole bunch of other things that those don't have, right, around telephony and, and other kinds of services, such that you have one integrated lifestyle app. No Western country today, right now, in November 2020, has an app even remotely as good as what they have, right? That's innovation. So it's a silly conversation at this point, right? You know, invent, the bottom line is that invention is one thing and innovation is another thing. And in invention, there's many areas where Western societies have an unquestionable advantage, right? The, the educational systems, the curiosity, the, uh, the dynamism, the risk-taking is all there in abundance, right? At MIT, at Stanford, at, at Cambridge, at Oxford, in life sciences, in, in computer science. It's, it's a wondrous thing. It's not a competitive thing. They're doing things that become the foundations for all global societies to take advantage of. But innovation is, did I put it to work, right? Did I, did I use it for the betterment of my people, right? And the fact is that we, it's really not fair that so many people in the United States of America don't have good internet access when the internet was invented in America, right? That's, that's literally unfair. It's not a good translation of invention to innovation in the public interest, right? It's a market failure. And, uh, and I think it's incumbent upon those countries that are inventors to make sure they're also innovators for the public. Otherwise, you lose some of the support uh, for the invention. And hence, you have you know, a, a, a anti-technology backlash and things like this. And I think that's obviously unnecessary, unfortunate, and could certainly be avoided. Does it, do you think that has something to do with this, uh, the US being strong competition, strong capitalism, strong uh, monopolies, like they don't realize that the market's actually big enough for everybody, they could roll out an infrastructure of, you know, a thousand Facebooks, a thousand Amazons, a thousand, and really make the, the infrastructure or the, the entire country better and, and give that access to everybody and it's actually a win-win for all or do you think some of that plays in? Because what I'm hearing is you're, you you kind of nailed the, you hit the nail on the head is that a, Asia uh, is really good at scale and innovation and quality and, and getting those things out and, and, and completed. And instead of talking and saying, oh, let's compete against this and, and you know, doing these, this other form. Is that what I'm hearing is correct or? Well, you know, I mean, look, Asia is not perfect. You know, the, if Asia were a country, it would be the most unequal country on the face of the earth by a very, very wide margin because you have the richest people in the world and the poorest people in the world crammed into this uh, space. But I do think that 
you can't get elected in an Asian country or even in, a, in an Asian non-democratic country unless you are talking about, talking the talk and walking the walk of inclusive societies, right? Uh, you know, th that's a genuine effort here. Even the leaders in Asia that we think of from the outside as being thugs are doing a lot for children's education and nutrition, right? And roads and electricity and hospitals. It actually is their number one priority. I mean, I literally mean the thugs in Asia have some conscience when it comes to this. And, and I mean that literally, I mean, I guess, except for North Korea, right? But uh, I've been to North Korea and you know, that would be the exception, but I've also been to every other country in Asia, the richest and the poorest. And, and I, you know, I'm not, I don't have wool over my eyes, right? I'm a fierce critic of uh, many systems and societies, but there, you can't, in, you, you have to have some kind of a conscience, really. You really do. You have to um, have some, look, I mean, look at the king of Thailand, just to take a live example from the news. The impunity of his office and the way in which he's dealt with it has led to mass protests in a country that we think of as being very deferential to authority because the people say, absolutely not, we will not have this, right? You know, we, we are, we have a certain solidarity as a society and that cannot be trampled upon. And that, that too is a beautiful thing, especially in a set of countries where, you know, people could be very afraid of their leaders, right? People, you know, we're talking about military dictatorships, we're talking about countries that have been authoritarian, but the people say, absolutely not. At the, at the end of the day, you know, we have to be treated with respect. And, and, and even that's happening. So there is that, but I don't want to go you know, too far into that, again, sociology of Asia, but you're talking about um, the US and you, you said a couple of minutes ago, the market is big enough for everyone. Not only is that true, if you don't have an inclusive market, your market's going to collapse. Where is your market if only 5% of the public has any money in their pocket to spend? Right. So, you know, this is an area that's been widely misunderstood. We've caricaturized, you know, caricatured economic debates as being kind of, you know, Milton Friedman extremism, you know, uh, versus socialism. But the truth is that even Milton Friedman acknowledged that if you have severe inequality and you have a plutocratic economic system, you're really not going to have a, uh, an, an active consumer base. Your firms will fail. Um, so, you know, th this is a false debate, an entirely false debate. And, uh, you know, you can get to that realization the easy way or the hard way, right? Uh, you know, right now, let's face it, we're taking the hard way in, in America. And, and that's unfortunate, you know, and in, in, in continental Europe, things look a little bit different in that regard. And that's probably, a, it's a point in the, in the Europeans favor. So I, I'm going to be interviewing uh, John Naisbitt, uh, who wrote uh, uh, Megatrends, his wife, Doris. Uh, John uh, retired and, and doesn't do anything in the public eye. But wrote the, they both together have been writing books for over 40 years and kind of this trends and, and futurist uh, type of movement. And um, really, they also ha have a book that you know says uh, the the future's Asian and, and um, that you know uh, is very uh, forward thinking on the Asian markets and I'm in full alignment and agreement. I love Asia, spend a lot of time there, and also feel it's more this um, games theory. It's more win win. It's more society. It's more long term, multi generational type of thinking. But as far as your book, the future is Asian. Can you kind of give us a what you, what your key takeaways are um, of, of why you focused on on that and, and what you're what what you're hoping to reach the rest of the world with and by by letting them know that. Well, you know, it was uh, I feel like it was a book whose time had come. You know, I I really had to correct some of the misunderstandings about Asia first and foremost that Asia is just China and kind of whatever China wants. And uh, that's not exactly true. Uh, you know, the geography of Asia is much larger than East Asia. What most of what we call the Middle East is in Asia geographically. Historically, even the Arab societies have more connectivity and trade and so forth along the Silk Roads with China and India than they have obviously, um, that's been, that was replaced during the colonial era with 
kind of leaning west, but now they're all leaning east again. So I wanted to take the full geography of Asia, point out that's much larger than China. 3.5 billion Asians are not Chinese, only 1.45 billion are Chinese. Um, and so kind of give that full picture of what I call the Asian system. So it's not really that the future is Asian, the present is Asian. You know, Asia is the majority of the human population. It's 50% of the world economy in, uh, in the purchasing power parity terms. Um, so for a whole long list of just, you know, bullet point uh, statistical, you know, reasons, the present and the future are Asian, no matter what happens anywhere, China or otherwise. So it, it, you know, obviously we should spend time and, and, and have a better, again, sort of systems and holistic understanding of how Asia works. It has its own historical dynamics that explain how Asian countries behave better than analogies to World War I or 19th century Europe and so forth. So, you know, there's a huge gap in our understanding uh, of Asian history. Our eyes glaze over. You know, we're like kind of deer in the headlights when we look at, uh, you know, episodes of Asian history that are obviously as significant for the world's future as anything in our own past. And uh, so, you know, I thought it was time to really put it all together um, into kind of one, one uh, you know, big fat statement. <laughs> that's beautiful. And, I, and that's really what I got out of it. And it, it, it uh, was so beautiful to me to, to, to see that I... I'm always uh, traveled to, to Asia, China, and a lot to Thailand, and spent a lot of time in the in, uh, Philippines as well. And, and I really uh, have seen this thing emerge over the years. So during the pandemic, really, uh, not only the Trump apocalypse and many others are trying to blame China on the pandemic, and uh, there's always fingers pointed to, to China or Asia for problems or how they're ruining the world. But I see it in a much different light, and that's one that I really would like humanity and especially the United States to see that they're really good when it comes to um, calling them out on the carpet and say, you know, when are you going to do something towards climate action, towards sustainability, towards biodiversity? When are you going to start producing your own products and doing your own things instead of putting blame on others and try to divide us as humanity here on Earth? Um, for example, during during the pandemic, well, uh, because a lot of Americans were too damn cheap to stock up on masks and respirators and the essential personal protection equipment, took the low bid from China, had China produce those masks, and uh, they didn't have enough in stock, they didn't have enough on hand, and uh, most of them came from China, came from Asia anyway, and um, put them in a perspective precarious position because of being cheap, because of getting the low bid, because of uh, let's do it cheap and quick and fast and, and whatever. Let's not plan ahead. Let's not be preventative. And there was this one, one thing last year that was really, uh, well, it was actually, yeah, it was last year that was really interesting. So Greta Thunberg sailed across and she was part of our documentary now and she sailed across the, uh, the ocean and went to the U.S. to the climate conference and um, or to the to the U.N. to a conference there, and it was really interesting. While she was in uh, New York and Washington, she went and sat in front of a congressional panel, and the guy in the panel there there was Democrats and Republicans, and there's a Republican representative there. Shows the panel, and they're all grilling them because it was. Uh, this Johanna versus the United States and this other group of uh, uh, youth that were suing the American government because of climate change. And they, so they were kind of welcoming them, but also kind of interviewing them, finding out about the problems. And as you watch this uh, uh, CPAC uh, television thing about this, you see this representative, this Republican with his iPhone, it's an iPhone, one, you know, one of the newer, newer ones, 10, 11, whatever they call them. And he's got it in his hand. And, and then it comes a time and he asks, he says, he goes to, to Greta and he says, really, we're, we're not gonna do anything until China does something, until Asia does something. Because they're the ones polluting, they're the ones creating these new coal power plants and, and doing all this negative stuff. Um, and what do you have to say 
about uh, we're doing just fine, we're doing great. What do you have to say about that? And it really put her on the spot and she really couldn't answer. It was a little, little flustered and you know, she says, you know, I'm just a kid and, and I really don't have the answer, the big political answer. But the United States has been in a position for many, many years where they're shipping their garbage to Asia, to China, to dispose of the garbage and plastic waste in Asia, let it, leaving them with the environmental impacts and the problems there uh, that were actually produced in the US. Secondly, those iPhones, the one that he was on on the panel, that was produced in China, it was put together in China and um, uh, a super product. Mo most Chinese don't even have, probably have the, the, uh, an iPhone, but yet they can produce it and have the environmental or the total environmental impact of that production. But yet, but it's okay for others to produce the United States shit and have the environmental impacts, but then at the back end of it to say, no, no, it's their fault. They're polluting. They're the ones who are doing it. And, and that's something that's not always clear in people's mind uh, until recently when we had the microscope again shown in where China says, we're not going to take your garbage anymore. We're not going to produce for the cheapest product. We're going to start charging you the total environmental cost because what we do is efficient. We don't want to harm our people and we want to have a better future. And, and so I really think the same when we talked about the Brexit, that a lot of countries are, are allowing other countries or other people to shit on their lands, to, to, to use their country as an open sewer and then reap the benefits of their food products, of their technology products or whatever they produce and then when it comes around to doing some action towards sustainability or towards uh, improving or applying those technologies, then it's always someone else's fault or they need more money. And so I don't know if you've ever seen it that way before, but for me, there really have never been these borders or these nations. I believe that we've been trading all over the world, but we need to put it into a better perspective. You know, what you're saying really resonates with uh, an argument that I've been making for a long time, which is about supply chains, right? What we really are is one global civilization connected through infrastructure and supply chains. And just because you didn't make your t-shirt uh, that you're wearing right now, you know, you are part of the supply chain by which that cotton was farmed somewhere, water was used to treat it, it was the electricity was used in a factory, human labor went into it, and then it was shipped, uh, you know, on, a, on some, uh, you know, cargo vessel across the oceans to come back to you. So you are part of that footprint of that t-shirt. And the same goes for the manufacturing of, uh, of you know, um, any kind of, you know, mobile phone product. By the way, just so that everyone knows, Samsung has doubled the global market share of Apple, right? Apple is more than twice as valuable, but if you want to just think about, you know, made in where and whose logo is on the largest number of uh, mobile phones in the world, Samsung is twice as many as Apple. So that's, that's twice as much Samsung garbage on the planet as Apple garbage, just in terms of mobile phones, just, just so that everyone knows. Um, so the Koreans also dump their garbage on other countries. Uh, you know, so do American manufacturers like Apple. But these Asian countries have now started to say, we don't want that anymore, right? We don't, we, you're, you've been paying us for this waste that is burying us. So even if you pay us five times more, we just don't want it. So you're having these ships turned around and sent back to America. Now, America technically has a couple of choices here, right? It can, it can bury it in the desert. Uh, it can burn it. It can find other ways to dispose it. It could actually recycle it. Uh, you know, start to design products with different materials so that they either biodegrade or can be, be reused, upcycled, and so on. And there you see different companies doing different things, right? You certainly don't see anything good happening at anything like the scale that it needs to happen. But hopefully that process of, you know, rejecting waste in advance, you know, convinces countries to change the way they, they make things in the first place. That's the conversation that needs to happen in corporate America. But that hasn't been a big focus yet, right? Because investors and corporate boards and asset managers and pension funds haven't yet forced uh, companies uh, to do that you know, on a large scale. In Europe, they certainly are a lot more stringent about those things. And you're tracing the supply chain way more carefully and all these kinds of things. Um, but 
is, is are there some efforts towards doing that in you know most developed countries? Yes, you know there are, and I think you know I wish all of these things went a lot faster, right? Can't we just see three or four steps ahead, see the writing on the wall, realize it's going to cost us a lot, realize the regulations are coming, see the environmental damage it's doing, um, you know, find cheaper and better at the same time. I mean, really win-win ways of doing the things that we're doing. You know, we could just hit the pause button now and do that. And it's just the pity that we don't, because as you know, you know, better than I do, there's a lot of damage that's being done on the way to that fairly obvious enlightenment. Here's the, the very first big hardest question I have for you today, and it's really the burning question, WTF, and it's not the swear word, it's actually, what's the future? And I, I, I know you can tell us the political and the global future, but I'd like to know more your, your vision of the future. What's the future, Tron? The future economy, you were saying? Yeah, what, what's the future? Well, you know, I'm, I'm actually working on a book about that right now. So maybe this is a little uh, sneak preview. So uh, probably, probably leave it on this note so I don't reveal any, any more, but it is about the future of human geography. And what I've basically done is to kind of take connectography, what connectography was for infrastructure and supply chains, I'm trying to do for people. I'm trying to anticipate five, 10, 20 years ahead, thinking about climate change, pandemics, economic crises, political upheaval, demographic imbalances, and how they all affect each other, and play it forward to try to understand where it, what are the what are the optimal geographies for humankind to uh, to to reside and to settle. Do we need to literally resettle the world population? based on all of these trends, and if so, where and how. Um, so it's a book of kind of demographic and geographic foresight. And uh, to me, that's the most important question of the future, because, you know, are we going to have AI that's very intelligent? Yes, I think we already know that, you know, are we going to have space based weapons? Yes, unfortunately, we are, you know, is there going to be, are there going to be robots doing human labor everywhere? Yes, we know that, you know, so the question is, where are we going to live in a way that that uh, that, that preserves our uh, you know human population in a sustainable way as best as we can? Is I think a big question that hasn't been answered. So that's what I've decided to to tackle, and uh, that'll come out next year. So we can uh, let's let's get together and talk about it then. <laughs> I definitely I definitely want to do that. I'll devour it, and then we'll have another podcast, another meeting about that. Um, what, what are your feelings on neo-Darwinism, neoliberalism, you know, this uh, fierce competition, only the strong survive natural selection? Uh, do you, like me, believe that's bullshit? And does that also tie a little bit to the future? Well, you know, there, there is a long tradition of uh, geographical determinism as well that feeds into this Darwinism. So the idea that geography is destiny demography is destiny, and looking at those questions at a country level, rather than us as a society and having the agency and the capability to make choices and change those kinds of fatalistic uh, predictions. So uh, I'm obviously on your side of the camp in that debate. Is that if you were to, uh, if I were to nail you down and make you pick one of your favorite uh, maps or the favorite cartography that you've ever put together, or you've ever seen, what one would it be? Well, you know, I mean, I work with the, the most incredible, uh, you know, GIS uh, data scientists and digital cartographers uh, in the world, really, for, for the maps that they've made, both for print and online. Um, and some of those are, again, they're on my website. Every, we make sure everything is free, freely accessible to the public. Anyone can download a high-res map and use it for whatever they want or go onto one of the platforms and manipulate variables and things like that. Because, you know, to me, if you're not learning geography, you're not, <laughs> you're, you're missing out on the, uh, on the most essential discipline. So, um, you know, the maps I would say have had perhaps some of the biggest impact in terms of visibility and getting people thinking, I found over the last five years. Um, one is the map that shows what happens to global agriculture if temperatures rise four degrees Celsius, which is, you know, 
an astronomical temperature rise. It's unconscionable. It's way past the point of no return. And I know that all of your viewers uh, know this, but just to underscore what cataclysmic scorching impact that has on ecosystems everywhere. Um, but it does show the Arctic being green and everything else being brown. And then as is what people may not know is the total population of the Arctic circle of the planet Earth is about 5 million people, right? Out of, you know, eight something billion people. So that's a scary mismatch. And whenever I present that, basically it's, you know, people are pretty aghast and you kind of have to stop and think about the implications of that. And another one is the pixelated map of the current human gem demographic distribution, which shows where we are. And again, there are no borders on that map. It's just every human being is a pixel. There's 8 billion of them. And this is how this is where we have evolved to settle. This is where we feel is our natural, you know, where everyone is not everyone, but most of us are in a livable habitat. And so it's the map that kind of shows most organically how nature has shaped our human geography. And that's incredible because it really shows just how, again, demographically Asian the world is, bright, huge pink over China and India and the other demographic concentrations, Europe and the East Coast of the US and so on. It's, it's beautiful and it, it gets, just gets people thinking about, um, you know, if even if the world were borderless, this could be where we were, would be, at, if it were not for climate change, right? Or how would things be different? Um, and there's one more that, that, that really, you know, it's the, the one about this new Silk Roads where I kind of did a lot of homework on every single big infrastructure project going on in Eurasia and we layered them into one map and you just see that it's meant to be a spaghetti bowl. It's meant to just be like, what? Like, look at all these lines, you know? And the point was to overwhelm the borders, right? To say like, sure, you've got big powerful states and heavily armed borders, but you've also got a zillion pipelines and railways and electricity grids and fiber optic internet cables and hydro uh, canals and all this stuff crisscrossing. And this is really how we overcome, again, that political geography and even the obstacles of nature to provide for each other, right? That's why we, we don't build this infrastructure just so we can roll tanks across and conquer each other, right? 364 plus days of the year, we use this to actually do things for each other. And we can reshape, you know, our geography in a constructive way. So, you know, some of these maps are really meant to have a moral message. And, and that's actually one of them. That's beautiful. At COP24 in Katowice, Poland, I sat uh, on, on a board for uh, the Global Energy Interconnection, which is, uh, was really spearheaded by a Chinese uh, organization called Gaigto. I don't know if you'd ever heard of them, but they basically have taken another form of cartography and mapped out the new renewable energy grid for the world and how they could roll out and scale that so that everybody can transfer. I mean, with renewable energy, it's the, the transportation is just not there to get it to everybody and there's no, no infrastructure. And so I, I'm also very aligned with you on, on the type of maths that you like and the, and the, the, the movement of uh, the future is Asian. Um, I also wanna make sure I connect you uh, to the Thailand Management Association. They have these top talks where famous doctors and professors have spoken at. I, I'm sure they would love to, to hear from you and, uh, and about your wonderful work in uh, Thailand, as we mentioned them as well. I have three last questions before we wrap it up, and it's really sustainable takeaways for my listeners. I'd like uh, maybe if, if, if you could depart some of your wisdoms and uh, to them, uh, what would be one message that you could depart to them that, that is a sustainable takeaway that would have the power to change their life, kind of your message, what would that be? Well, you know, it, do, it does relate to COVID in the sense that, you know, one of the lessons from this has been around food supply. And actually in your opening comments, you mentioned this, you know, rotting of food and waste of food and reburying food and that just generating more methane. And yet imagine if we had used connectivity better to move food around 
to those in need, even though it was a surplus at home because of you know ruptures and global trade, supply chains, and so forth. So such a tragedy. But one of the lessons has been we can grow a lot more food locally, right? A lot of countries are learning not to just keep on building cities on farmland, right? Give back to the farmland and grow your own food and you will reduce greenhouse gas emissions and you will build local resilience and, and have a healthier diet all at the same time. So I'd love for more people to think about how in this urban world where we tend to not appreciate nature and where things come from, where food comes from, that can change tomorrow. I totally believe that. I, I often say, you know, food uh, cities are a place that food goes to die. And I, I would really love for us to break that cycle, you know, to get the the linkages back and even uh, the waste of the, the human waste and the waste of compost or the composting that comes out of food waste, that that somehow gets kept back in the cycle to get back to the farms, to get back to our soils and things. Uh, the next question is, what should young innovators or cartographers or those interested in uh, geospatial data or in your field be thinking about if they are, are, are looking for ways to make real impact on our world? Well, actually, you know, uh, if only it were my field, you know, I feel like when I was in college, uh, not nearly enough courses were offered in, in, in this area of GIS. And now, fortunately, it is a much more prominent and popular uh, college major and a very useful one. And, you know, if you study um, uh, geospatial systems or, you know, earth observation, as it's sometimes known, GIS, um, you'll get a job guaranteed and you'll hopefully you'll be doing something quite meaningful. So I, I, I definitely encourage people, you know, very uh, uh, vigorously, uh, actively to study exactly those areas. What is something that you've experienced over your, your years that uh, and your professional journey that you would have loved to known from the start? Boy, if I only knew that, what is there something there? Um, you know, that most of the governments of the world, including our multilateral organizations, are kind of flying blind, you know, and in the same way that you kind of are a young student apprentice, you know, to, um, you know, more accomplished uh, academics, and then only after a long time of reflecting on their work, do you see all the flaws and mistakes in those people you admired. I would say that I, for too long, kind of, you know, was just deferential intellectually to authority, thinking that they knew what they were doing. And, uh, and they don't, you know, uh, they, they really don't. And now, now we're in a world where, and I'm not sure I really like this uh, very commonly used metaphor, but the tide has gone out and we can see who's wearing, you know, shorts or not. And there's probably just a very, very small handful, you could count them on one hand, governments in the world that are gonna, that can navigate on behalf of all their people in an inclusive way, um, you know, crises like what we're in right now, you know, and it's, it's no secret who they are when you're, when you watch the news every day. And that's, uh, let's face it, it's a terrifyingly small number of governments. And, and it didn't take the COVID pandemic for us to realize this, uh, or Brexit or the last financial crisis. I think that, you know, if we take a hard look at who's just coasting along versus who is actively, you know, preparing for a complex world is very, very few. And, and uh, you know, uh, I would, would, would go back in time and be way more harsh, you know, in my, my warnings and observations and, 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 and critique, again, constructive critique, right, of our systems, of our political systems. And I mean, now I think I'm pretty full throttle harsh but um, I could have, should have started that in my, my teens or 20s rather than, rather than now. You know, uh, in, in, in your book, uh, uh, in one of your books, you, you really talk about um, how the United Nations, the World Economic Forum, that those are foundations, private organizations that really everyone in the world has the ability to start something big, start something international that can be far reaching, that it's not some kind of a political or, or, or democratic process to, to get to that point to 
to change and our influence our world. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, I believe you also said we need more diplomats than we need. Uh, we need more people that are diplomatic and know how to to have a discussion and exchange without, uh, you know, dividing us. Um, can you maybe tell us just a tad bit more about that? Yeah, you know, that that's definitely um, one of the points in time, you know, when I started to think hard about who's actually doing something versus regurgitating resolutions, you know, and that that was, um, that was a book, uh, How to Run the World, that was a book about diplomacy, basically, because diplomacy is the process that we use to run the world. So it, it was a kind of like a provocative title, but it was actually completely literal. Um, it was. It wasn't meant to be like ironic or or arrogant. Diplomacy it was. My, my, it was written out of my deepest respect for the profession of diplomacy. As you mentioned at the beginning, you know, I studied at the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown, which is effectively America's diplomatic academy, and I went there for that reason because you know I have that deepest of respect for the profession. So that 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 book was uh, actually grew out of my my PhD, and and in the PhD I looked at some of these organizations that are saying, hey, look, we're not a government, but we're trying to improve global governance. Let us make a contribution. And it was the World Economic Forum and the Gates Foundation and other such bodies. And I looked at a whole suite of them and how they compete to be viewed as legitimate. And the way you can be legitimate is by doing something good, right? And, and I found that when we really measure global governance by that account, the answer to the world's problems is not, it must always be ratified at the United Nations by the General Assembly, or if Washington doesn't agree with it, it's not gonna have legitimacy. No, legitimacy comes from doing that good thing. And then you will inspire others and you will build that movement. And then you will have all the legitimacy and recognition that is needed. So it was a much more, it was an attempt at a bottom up kind of reconstruction of diplomacy in which, yes, as you said, everyone is a diplomat. And that that absolutely was one of the punchlines. I really liked it. And, and that's uh, what I wanted to end on. Um, thank you so much for your time. And unless you have a question for me or anything else that you didn't get to say, I think we're done. I really hope we can do this again when your next book comes out. I'd, I'd love to. This was a great conversation, and I'm so glad we covered, uh, you know, such a wide range of uh, topics. You know, the, the future of the world seems like such a vague notion, but uh, but you've made it incredibly concrete. So I'm so glad that we got a chance to talk about all of this stuff. Thank you so much, Farag. It's so wonderful. You have a wonderful day or night now, and uh, uh, say hi to your wife. <laughs> Likewise. Thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.